We focus the mind on the breath. It means that we have both of them here, where we can observe them. And ideally, it's good to be able to observe both of them together. Although some people find that it's easier to observe the breath, others find it's easier to observe the mind. But it's good to be able to watch them as they interact. First, of course, simply as a practical matter. When the mind wanders off from the breath, you want to know. When the mind feels comfortable or uncomfortable with the breath, you want to know. So you can know what to do about it. And some of the steps on breath meditation, the ones that focus directly on the mind, there are four altogether. There's being sensitive to the mind as you breathe in, breathe out, gladdening the mind, steadying the mind, and releasing the mind. And the text doesn't say how this fits into the practice altogether, but there are other passages referring to the frames of reference or the establishing of mindfulness that say you can encompass the whole practice under any one of the frames. And these four steps basically tell you what you're going to be doing with the mind. First, you want to be sensitive to what's going on in the mind. The breath is a good way of doing that. It's very close to the mind, and it gives you an anchor. It gives you a reference point, because it's very easy for the mind to drift around and not really know that it's drifting. But if you give it a specific task to do, then you can see clearly when it's with the task and when it's wandered off. It's like sitting in a train in a train station. You look over at the train next to yours and. Either your train is moving or that train is moving. And if you can't see a post between the trains, you have no idea which is which. You need that post, you need that reference point. And the breath provides that for the mind. Once you're sensitive to the mind, as you can watch it, then you get an idea of what you need to do. It basically comes into th three types of activities. One is to gladden the mind. In other words, try to bring the mind's energy level up if it's too low. The other is to steady it. If its energy is too erratic all over the place, you've got to get it to settle down. And then finally you release it. The general pattern here is you want to bring the mind into balance before it can be released. There's a popular misconception that awakening is kind of like a neurotic breakthrough. You go through a really bad, dark night of the soul, and all of a sudden the light opens and everything falls away. And although there are few accounts of awakening in the Tarigata and the Taragata, which indicate a person going through a really bad period before reaching awakening, the general picture in the canon is one of bringing the mind to balance. That's what the first two steps are. When you find the mind's energy level is low, you've got to bring it back up to the proper level. If it's too high, you bring it back down. This is reflected in the teachings on the seven factors for awakening. The energizing factors are analysis, right effort, and rapture. The calming factors are serenity, concentration, and equanimity. The terms are kind of abstract in general, and it's up to each meditator to find what specific techniques work. If you find some way of getting interested in the breath, that helps gladden the mind that you're working with something that's really worthwhile. I find that it really helped when I was first getting in breath meditation. If I had a sore foot, an injury someplace, to work with the breath energy at that spot, because it gave you a sense that you were doing something positive. 
you can actually see results. So you can think of the breath as a healing process or a rejuvenating process. John Lee notes how that as people get older, the out-breath gets longer than the in-breath, and the energy level in the breathing goes down. You might consciously say, well, today we're going to fight aging by having longer in-breaths and short out-breaths. See if the breath can have a rejuvenating influence on the body. But whatever technique you find that gives more energy to your practice. The John Fuhrer once said, you have to be really crazy about this to do it well. Because otherwise you sit here and things going to seem to be going okay, but you're not really paying that close attention. And okay begins to get a little loose and shaky and wobbly. That's when you have to heighten your level. It could easily be called obsession, like that video of the knife sharpener. The guy's obviously obsessed with sharpness of knives. And though it may seem extreme, that's how he became a good knife sharpener. Same way with the breath. You want to be really obsessed with what's the breath energy doing in the body? How does it relate to the other elements in the body? How does it relate to other sensations in the body? How can you explore this? When the breath seems to be going well, can it go better? And this is good for when the energy level is down and you need something to get more interested in the meditation, get your spirits up. If, however, you find that the analysis and the playing with the breath is just getting you more frazzled, that's a sign you need to get the mind more steady. This is when you develop patience, equanimity. Okay, whatever comes up in the breath, you're just going to watch it for a while not fiddle around so much with the breath. Give it a chance to settle down and just do its own thing. Slow down the breath. Spread your awareness to fill the whole body so it can't move so easily back into the past or off into the future. Because it's when the mind is brought to equilibrium, the level of energy is just right, that's when it's a lot easier to release it from its attachments. Because otherwise your release is just aversion, dislike. You're trying to run away from something. You don't like this, you don't like that, and you push yourself away. And the pushing, of course, becomes another type of becoming. As the Buddha said, craving for non-becoming leads to more becoming. When you think about the image of the middle path, it's middle both in the sense that it can be the middle point of a spectrum, and it can be off the spectrum entirely. That's what the release is. You're getting off the spectrum, whereas in balancing between excessive energy and deficient energy, that's when you're bringing it into the middle of the path, the middle point on the spectrum. It's the middle point where you can get off. Most of us think that it's going to the extremes, so you can jump off the end. But the Buddha said, no, the jumping off point is here, right here in the middle. Everything seems balanced. The tranquility is balanced with your insight. The energy feels just right. Your level of desire is just right. Your level of persistence, your intentness, your level of analysis, these are all just right, and they're coming together. when everything feels balanced and you're very alert. That's when you begin to see things you didn't see before. You're in a more neutral position. Of course, the, the neutral position here is what allows you to see. So you're trying to develop both specific techniques to bring the mind into balance and also getting a sense of where is that point of balance. When is your energy level too high? When is it too low? 
And what are the danger points? One is when you've been practicing for a long time and the results aren't coming as quickly as you'd like, or things were going well and they're not going as well as they used to be. That's when you've really got to work on gladdening the mind. Something really good happens, the mind starts elaborating all kinds of excitement. That's when you've got to steady it. So you can watch what happens next and what happens next. Because we're here to watch cause and effect. And when the Buddha boiled down what happened on the night of his awakening, it was the discovery of a causal principle. It sounds pretty mundane. But he realized it was essential to his awakening, seeing what caused what, and then how you could manipulate that in the direction you wanted it to go. So when an insight comes, you want to see, well, what happens as a result of having that insight? You don't want to get carried away by it. You want to maintain your steadiness. Because some very interesting things happen after the initial burst of insight. Other more subtle insights can arise. So you really want to be careful about the level of balance you maintain. And then you can understand, okay, what was it that led you to get latched on to something or led you to get pushed away and bored with something? Where you can step out a bit of your normal range of choices. That's what the release is all about. You begin to see there are more choices than you thought. So try to get to know your own mind. This is part of what being sensitive to the mind is all about. Not only what state it's in, but also what works, what techniques, what ways of encouraging it when it needs encouraging it, what ways of calming it down when it needs calming down. Have worked for you in the past. Bring out your old tools. Bring out your old strategies. Sometimes they'll work again. Sometimes they won't. Okay, then watch for a while and see what might work this time. And until you can bring the mind to that point of equilibrium, where there's the door to freedom. <laughs>